Hello, everyone. My name is Zhang Hai Liu from UC Berkeley, and I'm a sixth year PhD student, and I mainly work on mixed signal design, design automations, and ADC design. So today I will talk about the analog circuit design using DAC2 and DAC3 with some examples and examples of the chip with tape out and also show some difference in the flow pan and some new functions in DAC3. So here's the outline. I will first briefly introduce DAC, but I'm sure most of you already know. And also, I'll talk about the layout generator in back two, the main back three, and also some other features in back three. So, as you all know, we use Berkeley Analog Generator to develop our analog circuit design. And the reason we use that is because it helped us to get the it helped us to bridge the gap between complex systems and our productivity. So. First, as you know, the design rules increase very fast as technology scales, but with properly set up generator framework, those complex design rules can be captured by circuit generators. And also in the generator de based design, which what we try to do is to capture the entire design process and automate that by using the generator script instead of only focus on a specific instance. So the diagram here shows the a typical bag design flow. So from the given specs, we can translate that into parameters of a generator. And the layout and schematic generators took those parameters and generate a DRC LVS clean instance. And then back can take the instance from extraction and simulations and iterate on that. So the reason the generator help is first, everything is parameterized, so we are able to change the circuit and get the feedback quickly. And also we can develop the, our generators incrementally by including more uh, functions and features in the circuit generators. And also it's process portable, which means we can use them in different process. So the feature on the bottom shows a typical bag workspace. So it's basically a set of APIs that users to code up their layout and schematic generators that also have some measurement and design scripts to verify the performance. So it's basically a, a interface between the Python and the CAD tools. Then I will talk about the layout generators I've been working on in the back two. So first is this Lego layout generation engine. And the diagram here is the time to live star DC generators in Lego. So there are two layout generation engine back to, and here is the first one Lego engine. You use hand drawn primitives. So in this way, we need to manually create a set of building blocks for transistors, tabs, dummies, and maybe some boundary cells, and also define the routing grid. And when we write the generators, we assembled those primitives using Python script. And I've been working on develop the primitives for the Intel 22 process. And also we tape out this generator with some improved sampling feature in Intel 22 FFL in 1920. And it's a six, it's a nine bit and 16 way interleaved and sample at 10 gigasample sample per second ADC. And we have, because of we, the generator we use, we can uh, have different version of a subchip on the same chip. So the, the way we integrate this chip is first the ADC core is fully generated and we place it along with the memory block in the top level and manually integrate them into a full chip. So this is what I use uh, for the Lego layout generation engine. So in my opinion, one, one problem of this layout generation engine is, is less flexible because we always need to create different uh, primitives manually and also define the routing grid. 
but it does have some advantages like it offers different flavor of transistors once we define them in the primitive libraries. So compared with uh, XBase, we might have a wider range of the device we can use in Lego. And another layout generation engine in, in back to is the XBase. So it has some efficient uh, subclass for analog and digital circuits separately. So first is the analog base, which provides some flexible wire spacing and with a handle the device matching. So when we draw the layout, you will automatically insert the front end layers and M1 and M2, some lower level routing layers dummy. And the analog base need to be assembled in the template base as well. And the digital base is used for digital like circuit design and the layout is much more compact compared to the analog base. And it can also be tired recursively. And the analog base and the digital base are both assembled in template base, which is a higher level of class in the X space. And the picture on the bottom shows a DAC generator design in back to using the these several layout class I mentioned. And this size is an example of using generators. So this is a massive MIMO system chip with tape out in 2020. So it has eight channels that performs uh, baseband, baseband digital signal processing and also use many back generated instance like the ADC and DAC that I just mentioned and also some other uh, clock and current mirror circuitry that we use from previous design. So the chip is eight millimeters by four millimeters and it is also implemented in Intel 22 FFL process. So all the analog components are basically generated by DAC. The ADC is generated by the Lego and the decks and clocking and car mirrors are generated by the X base. We are able to reuse those generators from all previous tape out, which make us uh, develop this chip like faster. So to summarize the analog and digital base in X base, this slide shows how the floor plan of them looks like. So first in the analog base, the layout, we have multiple rows of N-type and P-type transistors. And we can also have only P-type or only N-type transistor, but we cannot mix them, which means if we won't have uh, P and N transistors alternatively, we need to assemble different analog base in template base. So which mix, this layout not very efficient in some cases. And in the analog base for each rows, we have only same width and also the width of transistors can be changed by change the number of fingers. And we only in we only put the actual active transistors in the layout and the other empty space will automatically be filled by the dummies and the connection of those dummies and record, and we can easily add dummies in the schematic generators. And each rows has some properties we need to define in the YAML file, like the width orientation, the wire spacing and width. And usually in the analog base first two or three routing layers are hidden. So that means the first layer we can access to are usually N3 or higher layers. So it does limit out the available routing layers in some cases. And the diagram on the bottom side shows the how the digital base work. So I think the goal here is to minimize the area and to maximize the available routing layers. So we'll have one or two more routing layers compared to the analog base. It's usually the contact is at M1 or some first layers. So it's implement using the Lego base in X space. I think the name is a little bit confusing, but the idea is you try to copy what we do for the Lego layout generation engine. 
And as for the transistor range, we can have alternative P and N transistors, and also we can put sub uh, sub connections in the same rows as the transistors, while we can only put those tabs in different rows in the analog base. And of course, we can have only a tab in the same row as well. And also in the digital base, the dummy transistor is not added. So it's not automatically added like in the analog base. That means when we try to uh, have good matching, we need to insert dummies manually. Uh, not manually, but explicitly in the our code. And the template base is the class that we use to assemble both analog and digital base. And the way the, the main challenge here is when we manually connect different blocks, we are aware of the sizing and the pin locations of the uh, different blocks. But in a generator, we kind of need to instantiate a template of the layout. And then after that, we can access to all the information and use the those information to calculate the uh, locations of different blocks and do the routings. Another important thing is there are some uh, predefined routing grid in back, which means when we assemble them in a higher level, we need to run those uh, locations and the pin locations of each block on the top layer grid of this current template-based class. So it in some cases, it limits the resolutions of the routing layers. So because we have to put those routing layers in this predefined routing grid, so that means we cannot have any connections or wires, for example, in this, uh, in this gaps. And speaking of those wires, in both back two and three, wires are managed by this track manager class. So the wire can be quite complicated because if we have n wires and consider the width and space of them, you kind of have a quite complicated combinations if you want to adjust the width and space of the wires. So in the X space, we use this track manager to manage the width and space of different type of wires. So instead of dealing with individual wires, we we put them into different category like signal, clock, supply wires. So the wires of the same name will have the same uh, width and same minimum spacing to other wires. And every time we need to, every time we want to do a connections, we first uh, look for the predefined width of this wire and do the necessary connections. And we only put those hard-coded spacing and width in the YAML file instead of put those hard-coded numbers in our generators. So those are basically the layout floor plan and the generator I've been working on in back two. And next, I'll talk about the layout generator in back three and show how those are different with back two layout generator. So first in back three, the layout generator doesn't have different uh, analog base and digital base anymore. So we only we all use this small space to draw all the layout. So in the most space, we can tie different blocks together as long as they share the similar like for open info. So from this diagram, you can see in this most space zero, it has three different layout class or three different circuit. One is in most space one and the other two is in most space two and three. And as long as they, they share the same row information, which means it is shows it basically implement same type of device. So they can be closely tied together. And this feature is very similar to what we have in the Lego base. But in the Lego base, you have to like tell them in an alternative way, which means that every old, every old rows are flipped. Uh, 
but in the most cases, it does have more flexibilities. And also inside each row of transistors, we can have the wire width and space defined in the YAML file, which is similar to analog base. So I will talk more about that later. And also in this case, we can put substrate contact in the same rows as the transistors. And it can be any combinations of different uh, tab and NFAT and PFAT rows. So it does make the layout generator more flexible. And in the most ways, only the like active transistors we put in the layout generator are drawn and there's no boundaries and we will leave many empty space. So here it shows an example. On the top side is the most space layout. So you can see that only the main transistors we use are instantiated here and there are some tab style tab cells at, at the two sides of the layout. And after we finish the mode space, we have a mode space wrapper class that wrap up the mode space and fill in those gaps and make the DRC green layout. So as I mentioned earlier, we need to define the different, so here basically we need to define the properties of each rows here and define how them how to them tear together. So those definitions are also in the YAML file. So in my opinion, the YAML file does become more complicated in back three. So first we can have only one tile in the layout. In this case, it's very similar to the digital base in back two. We only define like a combination of different rows of transistors and also define the track managers here. And we can tile this single tile, we can repeat this single tile several times like in the digital base in back two. But we can also have more complicated layout like this multiple tile layout example. So in this most space, there are basically three types of different tiles. So in the YAML file, we need to define them separately. And first, this entries, the tiles entries define how uh, how we put those tile zero to two together. So you can see from the bottom side, it will start with tile zero and tile one and tile zero again, but this time it's flipped and then it's the tile two. So this part defines how we arrange those different tiles in the layout generators. And as for the details for the different tiles, we define them under the tile specs. So under the tile specs, you can see this tile zero and we define how many rows it has in this tile. And also we need to define the same information for tile one and two as well. As for how to uh, abut those tiles together, it also has a abut list we need to define. So this about list basically tell the generators, I'm going to put the tile one very close to tile zero, but tile two maybe won't touch tile one. So with this information defined, the generator is able to figure out the, the minimum space between different tiles and make more compact layout. So you can imagine with more complicated layout is YAML file, this YAML file will become very complicated easier. So that's one disadvantage advantages in back three. So in many cases, you will have very long YAML files because of those informations, you need to define them in the YAML file. And in back three, we also have more uh, detailed control over the wires. So as I mentioned earlier in back to analog base, we only have access to M3 or M4 in the analog base. And maybe we can access to lower layers in the digital base, but we cannot control the wire width and space easily. And in back three, you kind of expand how, expand the uh, uh, wire features in the most space. So for lower metal layers, it has finer control on that. So before, we only have, we can put wires in the gate side or the string and source side. But now in back three, it has some more 
uh, places we can put the wires. We can have this G mesh and DS mesh wires, which means it won't go across the polys in the transistor. So you can define those wires information in a YAML file and make sure like the wire is at the place defined. And also it supports more complicated uh, wire locations in transistor. So for each each side of the wires, we can give it different names like wire ABCs. And if you share the same name, you must give it a index. Like the second example here, you cannot put two A in the wire list. Instead, you need to give the wire A some index. And also you have different kind of alignment. For example, in the example three here, we have wire A, B, and C. And you can define how those wires are aligned. They are by default center aligned, and you, but you can also put them to lower or up higher uh, locations in the layout. And you can also define, for example, in the example five, we can see the wire A is in the DES region and wire B is in the DS mesh region. That means wire A will start from DS part, but wire B will start from here. So it gives us more control over the wires in the transistor rows. And also you can put multiple lists in this wire, uh, wire list. In the example six here, you can see, first we define A, wire A and wire B zero to two. And then we define where B0 and C. And depending on the order of definitions in the YAML file, we first place wire A and all the wire Bs. And after that, you look at the second list and figure out like we need to place wire C after all the wire Bs. So you will basically give you this result. So these are all defined in these row specs. So in, inside each low specs, we can define different wires we want in the gate side and also in drain source side. So in this way, we have more control over the lower routing layers. And also it has some, uh, it added more support to support some process which has some limitation in the metal waste and lens. So, if you have limitation in, in some process, you only support quantized mental lens. That means we need to extend the mental if it doesn't uh, happen to be exactly the value we, it defined in the process. So it will automatically extend to the quantized lens if we ask with, so we need to define like available lens of metals in the YAML file. And in those cases, it can ex automatically extend to those quantized lens. And also if the process only support quant quantized wire waves, before we can only have this continuous wire, now it supports uh, break those wires into several pieces of quantized metal waves. So it does make our life much easier in some process. Otherwise we need to like basically instantiate one thing wires and repeat it several times. But now all the uh, calculations and break into several wires, those algorithms are implemented in the back framework. And here I want to show a very simple example of the inverters. So if you are familiar with back to maybe you can look at this code and see what's the difference here. So in my opinion, it's very similar to the digital base and there are many functions we can still use. So here, the first two lines is basically add some transistors. So you can see the self dot add most functions. And after that, you give it the row index, the number of fingers, the width of transistors, the number of stack transistors. So here with these two lines, we add NMOS and PMOS separately in the layout and also instantiate the track manager. And after that, we can load the wire locations. 
So these two lines basically we give it a wire the wire type. So it can be DS means the wire is in the source and drain region, and it can be G, which is the gate region. And you can also have other type like DS match and G match, like I mentioned earlier. And after that, you give it a, a row index and while tab, you will return the check IDs and we can use the track IDs to do the connections. So here you basically return the supply tracks for this inverter and we can access to the source and drain and gate of these transistors and connect to this track ID. And the track lower and track upper here means we extend this wire to the lower and upper boundaries of this cell. And after that, we basically re repeat this uh, track ID for the drain of the transistors. So we get this, uh, this drain wires for the PMOS and NMOS and connect to them. And also we connect the gate together by get this in wires. So it's very similar to what we do in back to, in my opinion. And after that, we can go to higher layers, like the vertical layers here, the example shows the M3. So we use this cord to track functions to get access to the location of these VM wires. And after that, we take the VM track index and instantiate a track ID. And after that, we can connect the drain of PMOS and NMOS to this uh, VM track. And the last step is just add some pins to, to this inverter. And as I mentioned earlier, in the MOS space, you only draw the extra transistors. So in the layout generators, what we instantiate is these transistors and some tabs. And after that, the most space buffer will fill in those, those gaps and finish the layout. So compare the difference between those two pictures, it has dummies, dummy police fill in, and also it make the continuous diffusion region and have boundary cells around the uh, inverter to make it have a clean boundary when we apply this with other uh, layout generators. And here it has a more complicated layout. I won't go into the details, but I just want to show how we build more, maybe slightly more complicated layout generators. So here I try to show an example of the just strong arm comparator. So basically the idea is we first implement half of the strong arm and then we have two half of these layout generators about together to make a full circuit. And in this strong arm half layout generator class, we first still add the transistors. We give different rows and the columns and also the segment of the transistors and the transistor waste. And after we add the transistors, it basically instantiate those different transistors here. And after that, we need to get the track uh, locations. We usually use this get track ID functions to access to different predefined wires. And after that, we just do some similar connections like we did in the inverter examples and going to higher routing layers, we use this uh, call to track functions to calculate the location of higher routing layers location and make the connection. And after that, we put two, two of these, I say half class together and also add the subject connection on the top and bottom. So you can see that first we need to make the template. After that, we add this to, I say half class on the two side of the layout generators and do the necessary connections and also instantiate the substrate connection here. And also here, you also only show the most space and because it's in most space, it's, it's still left some empty region here. 
that doesn't have any dummies and it doesn't have a clean boundary. Once we put this in a more stress wrapper, it will fill in those empty gaps and also make it have a clean boundary around the generator. So this is about the generator, the layout generator in back three. And next I want to talk about some more uh, new features in back three, the simulation design features. I will only talk about some very simple example here. And I believe Ayan will give you guys a more detailed example that he used in his research tomorrow. So in back two, we basically, in order to run simulation, we basically set up the test bench first, like a schematic template. We instantiate the like DOTs in the schematic, put a voltage source and load. And also we need to add analysis in the ADE XL. And every time we run simulation, we basically look back, basically to copy this predefined test bench template and the ADE XL session and replace the DOT with the generated instance and run the simulations. So in my experience, it sometimes can take really long time to return the result when the data is when the data is large in the simulations. And back three do this job in a different way. So for example, it defines a generic schematic template which means in a schematic template, you basically only define one voltage source as a start point, then you can replace it with different type of voltage source and you define a DOT and some load and all the construction of test bench is done in generator scripts. So it has a test bench manager that also loads parameters from the YAML file and it first it generates the instance and add load and source from the parameters we define in the YAML file. And it can also set up analysis and different post data post processing in back scripts. And after that, it basically directly create a net list from the test bench managers and call spectral or other like simulators to run the simulations on the generated net list. So the most obvious difference here is, is you don't see a test bench is copied in the virtual library, but it only produce several net lists. And also because you directly run the spectral result, which is open. So it doesn't need to load the data from AD sessions. And in most of cases, it make the data processing much faster. So here, besides the test manager, besides this test bench manager class, it also has measurement manager and designer base. So the measurement manager basically take generated instance and it handles all the processing steps that need to measure a specific performance. And you can create uh, different test benches and the designer base here we can implement a design script here the simplest design script probably just you can sweep the sizing and different options of your generators so it will call the measurement managers and test bench managers with different uh, generated instance and do the necessary uh, calculations in this way, you can have a closed loop design scripts and at least you can sweep or try different uh, generator options. Also, it support run simulation in parallel use the concurrency Python. So basically it can launch several simulations in Python at the same time and handle the return result properly. And on the right side, it shows an example, very simple example here I use. So here is a bootstrap sampler, which is a circuit that only has a limited number of transistors. And I do have several options in the generators I want to compare how do they work in different scenarios. So I can use this designer base to generate instance with different sizings and different options. And it will 
do the data post processing and return the result. Here is a example of returned result from the designer base. So I basically pick the several peak performance generated in, in a in a bunch of generated instance. It picked these three different instances. So Ayan will talk about more details and design script he used in his research. So he will show you guys how to write the closed loop design script and use a uh, different kind of measurement manager and test bench managers to run more complicated simulations. And also you will, uh, it support generate models. If you want to use uh, very log A models and also maybe lost lib and left files used for like digital flow, you can use back to generate them as, generate them as well. And Ion will also cover them tomorrow. And after that, I won't briefly show the workspace structure. It's very similar to back to the basically with separate no. technology specific. Yeah. Uh, hey, so you have to. So does it do all the net listing for you, or is there a way to get that from the PDK still? Uh, I think it would. So first, you need to define the netlist primitive, like the schematic primitive in back prim library. And after that, it will do a net listing. Basically, it will get the net list from your generated instance and it will instantiate the load and water source you define in the YAML file and do a net listing for you. Okay, so there's some process specific setup that you have to include then for that, you're saying? And then BAM yeah. gets that and generates the net list? Yeah, so there will be some process specific setup. Basically, tell back like when you see this uh, back transistors, how to map them to a PDK transistors. So there will be some like net list setup that is new in back three. So we don't have this net list setup in back two. So for the PDK, uh, for the workspace structure, we basically separate some PDK related folders and some are like technology, not, not technology specific folders. So here is an example. So under this spec three workspace, you have some process specific some modules that define the DAC framework, X space and back three digital analog so those are all generate generator repos. And you have some process specific, uh, some modules. For example, I use like Intel 22 here. And you have some data, which are also process specific. You might have different data for different process. And in order to run the back three, it uses a slightly different way. So it doesn't open the Python terminal. So every time you need to generate a uh, generate instance, you can call this run back script and give it a pass to this genocide.py script and also the pass to the YAML file. And for measurement and design, you also have different scripts and you can give it pass to YAML files and you can so with those pass. The run back script can run the generate generation measurement and design script separately, and you can also call the. Uh, uh, you can also run this with dash dash flag to see different options. So here is yeah is the examples in the UCBR repos. Maybe it's not open source, but I just want to show you like the scripts is basically the same when you're running it and for schematic library import you is exactly the same as back to you open the first way define the schematic template in virtual library and then open uh, ipython and import the schematic to back so lastly i will show an example of the generator i'm currently working on so it's basically showing a uh, very complicated generators that can to prove like generators can take care of 
like complicated circuits. So here I use a generator-based design methodology to develop uh, high-speed time-to-leave AEC generators based on the Lego generator work I've worked before. So the size here shows the proposed ADC architecture. It's a time-to-leave two-stage ADC. Inside each channel, you use SAR ADC as the first stage and use VCO-based ADC as a second stage and have a reamplifier in between to amplify the residual voltage. So this slide shows the key blocks here. So it has the sampling part, residual amplifier, SAR ADC, and VCO-based ADC. And it also shows how did I uh, write the generator code in different bases in the back three and how assemble how to assemble them in different hierarchy in template base. And here it shows uh, like a summary a summary of this generator. First is the sampler plus the star stage. This is generated in back three in Intel 22 process and also, it has the visual base ADC and ring amplifier, and it also show the generator layout. And here, this blog wants to show that we can take the generator instance and run simulations in back as well. And and here it shows how the I integrate the generator instance in one chip. So first, basically, I took all the generator instance and also with some digital synthesized blocks and manually integrate them into a subject. Yeah, that's all I have today. Thanks for your attention. Okay, I believe it's time for some questions. So anybody from the audience? Uh, yes, please. I have one question. Uh, why not we define a pin for the bulk? Because here we only define the gate and the drain and source. In in back two and also three, I didn't see the definition for the bulk. Uh, sorry, can you say it again? Why should be should be uh, should be in a slide number sixteen? Uh, ca can we define or uh, add the definition for the bulk if we need to reconnect the bulk of transistor to any? internal uh, pin yes here here we have only drain source and the gate yeah we still only have drain source and gate in back three okay so we don't have the bulk usually we put by default to connect it to the uh, highest voltage or lowest voltage right yeah yeah but you can so in the primitive setup, you do have access to lower layers like the gate connection and source and drain connection, like the M zeros. Okay, thanks. Another yeah. slide you had like N tap and P tap, right? Aren't those your bulk connections? In the tiling. Uh, in here. Were you talking about tiling? Yeah. Yeah. Those are your bulk connections, right? Oh, you're asking those tab connections? Yeah. Yeah, you do have access to those tab connections. You instantiate those tabs basically like how you instantiate the transistors in the layout. And you have access to the source and drain of the tab. They are essentially the same thing, but it's basically the even and odd uh, columns of the tab. And you can do the connections in the generator like connect transistor to tab. One question on my side, this one is answered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so how do you handle uh, like stacked devices? Like stacked devices? Yeah, I mean, imagine you have like the FinFetch uh, technology where you usually then probably uh, stack devices if you uh, want to have like a different length of device. Um, at least I think I saw somewhere like some uh, stack device generators flying around somewhere. And um, yeah, so, so how do you do this? 
So basically, with certain channel lengths, you can do this stack by simply give it a stack number here. So for example, I won't have a stack of two, I just put a two here. You will have a stack of two transistors. But for different channel lengths, you do have to implement different mode space because inside one mode space, you can only have one channel lens. So if you have different channel lens, you need to separate them in different mode space. But if you just want to uh, stack transistor to increase the effective channel lens, you can change the stack number here. So what happens if you have the Plata technology, they want to define or set one length? Um, yeah, would you still use just the stack um, parameter? Or do you have a different one? Oh, if you want have a different channel lens that is defined in a YAML file, so inside each list, uh, painful parameters, you define a channel lens here. So let, that means if you want to have different channel lens, you kind of need to separate them into different mode space because inside here, the channel lens is only defined once and it will be used in all these tiles. And you set it as kind of a parameter to the generator? Yeah, channel lens is a parameters. I also need to set up them in the primitives setup to make it support different channel lens because those might make the primitive drawing very different for different channel lens. Okay, I have one more question, please. How can we yeah, control, sure. how, how can we determine the location or the coordination of the transistor? I mean, for example, if I would like to put it in somewhere else except the bottom left corner, can we? Oh, I see. Yeah, so in order to, so when you place transistors, you need to first tell the generator which tile you're placing. For example, there are four tiles here. I can tell the generators I'm going to place the transistor in the third tile. And I can, inside this tile, I can place in the maybe second rows and have a different column. So I can tell the, the generator I'm going to place the transistor in the third tile, the second column, a uh, second rows, and like maybe here. So in this, when you place a transistor, you tell I'm going to place at this row and this column. And by default, it plays at tile zero, but you can also give it a different tile numbers. Okay. So from here, yeah. I can expand horizontally or vertically, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay, any additional questions? Uh, yes, please, one more, sorry. Yeah, uh, for for the measurement, for, for the measurement. If we would like to add uh, uh, the simulator, but uh, okay, yes, because here in, yes, I can one slide more. Uh, re this, this question relating to ATX areas, because now from my experience, uh, Kittens stop improving ATE XL. Now they already have another tool called Assembler, much more comfortable and uh, and powerful. So can we re also replace it uh, in Pack 3 to use Assembler tool? So I think uh, Pack is still only support ATE XL in Pack 2 and Pack 3 it doesn't it actually doesn't deal with uh, ADXR or the uh, Metro uh, ADE assembler and explorer, but it only run Spectral in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, so they only they don't rely on any tool, just to take the, the simulator itself as a Spectral. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But how we can define uh, if we need to write equations for measurement or to get some uh, definition for the parameter. This equation also should be written in Python? 
Yeah, so for the data post-processing, post you yes. need to do this in Python, but the variables I believe is defined. So the, the design variables you define in the simulation will be stored in the returned data as well. So you can still access to them. But for the post-processing, you need to do this in Python for back three. Okay. So here uh, we still add everything. Uh, uh, you mean the stimuli, the, the definition, the parameter, all of that should be defined by the files, not EDE XL. File yeah. to Python. Okay, uh, much better. Thanks. Yeah. You uh, go back to the tiles slide. Up tiles. This one or the one earlier? This one? Uh, so the tiles can be of different size, right? So tile, oh. tile zero looks like it has three rows and three columns, right? Yeah, tiles can have different size. Like I, I think in this example, like for example, tile one has three rows versus tile zero and two, it has only two rows. So the tiles, basically you can define them like separately and only tell the generator how to abut those tiles. Okay, and then here your pink are like P-type, for example, and the, N, or the blue are N-type maybe? Is that what you're trying yeah, to Yeah, show? yeah, yeah. So I basically try to show that you can have a mix of N-type and P-type device compared to analog base. How do you choose between having rows of transistors within a tile and having you know, rows of tiles? So the rows of transistors between tiles is defined under this row specs, under this entry. You define how many rows you have for these tiles. And as for how many tiles is defined under this tiles entry. So here it defines tiles is arranged in this way. How do you add a column, a new column of tiles then? A uh, column is uh, specified in a generator. It's basically decided by how many columns you use. And you can also define like some extra space columns. It's also done in generator. It doesn't take as a input parameter. So in the generator code, uh, you decide which column to place the transistor. And after the placement, you can like define, okay, this generator will have this number of columns. So if I take this as an example. So here I can place those different transistors and I have one one line of code I didn't sh I didn't show here because it's kind of redundant. So after you place all these transistors, there will be a like self dot like set more space something like that. It will look at how many columns you use after you do the placement. You if you don't define the columns in that line of code, it will pick the maximum columns you have used now. And if you define how many columns you need in this generator, you will set this generator to be like the number of columns you define. And can you do some sort of symmetry with the tiles? You mean left and right symmetry? Yeah. So this, yeah, this is basically how I did here. So first I have like left and right side of this half circuit. And after that, I have this self dot set more size. It define number of columns here, right? So basically in this way, you have like perfect left and right symmetry in the layout. So in this layout, first here we define half circuit, and after that we instantiate the half circuit twice, 
And here for the left side, we flip the left and right so that it's aligned and aligned in the middle, like Y axis. Here you have three tiles, is that right? In the half, in the half version? Yeah, in the half version, I only have one tile that only instantiate these transistors. And in the full versions, we have three tiles, have the tab, untab and p-tab, and also the core circuit. Okay, so the core half circuit is just one tile. Okay, yeah. The two tabs and then double it. Okay, all right. Yeah, and uh, how many columns is defined actually in this line? Yeah. Then, okay. Then there's where you're doing the routing between the files, yeah. So the wrapper thing is only called once uh, in the top level of the design. Oh, sorry, can you repeat? What's uh, the the wrapper is? thing, the most base wrapper thing that yeah, makes yeah. the dummies and the boundaries, they're only called at the at the top level of the design. Yeah, so it's basically done automatically for you. When you every every time you call a more space generator it will automatically call a more space wrapper and you only done once on the top level after finishing the tiling so then for hierarchical designs all you put into the generator code um you, you make references to these um classes you define which are uh inherited from more space so in a high level for example when you assemble different layout class in template base, you only instantiate most base wrapper, like this wrapper class, and give it the parameters for this most base class. So in this way, you will draw the most base and wrap it up and put in a template base. Okay, Also for, for the different columns that you said, like you define inside the generators, do you feed different YAML files into them? Because the YAML files have a, have the definition of um, the parameters that each row in each column has. So the YAML file actually only define how many rows and what are the transistors in each rows. And for columns, it basically depends on how many columns you use. And of course, you can have more columns here. For example, here you only define the how many columns I use in this generator, but I can put some extra number here to make it I have some empty space. I was talking about the one with the multiple instances of uh, most base, the one with most base one, um, two, and three, all yeah. inside most base zero. Yeah, so I, I was thinking like, um, so. Uh, how exactly do you did you do this? You have um like two columns defined in the generator code of most base zero, right? And like the the instantiation of um like so most base two and most base three are in the same column. So uh, how exactly oh, do you do that? So first we need to define tiles zero and tile one. So this diagram basically means most zero, uh, most space zero has these three sub layout class, but most space one includes two tiles, tile zero and tile one, and most space two only use tile one. So what we define in YAML file is those tile, tile zero and tile one. And when we instantiate the layout in most space zero we basically look at how many columns we use in most space one and tell the generator to place most space two and three like on the right side of most space one but the important thing is most space two need to share the same row information as most space one so these two rows are exactly the same in yaml file that only because of that we can place more space to like next to it. So 
So it like happens automatically. So we define a total number of columns that are available for MOSBase 0, and then the, the program thinks about how wide MOSBase 1 is, and then if it can still fit MOSBase 2 in, it then places it beside it. Uh, it's more like first you place MOSBase 1, and after that you place 2 and 3, and after you place these three blocks, you tell most base zero, I need this number of columns. That makes sense now. Uh, also, I, I have a question about um, in one of the ending slides, maybe like uh, three slides from the ending or something, uh, you had the link to uh, something on GitHub. It was um, bag3 underscore AMS underscore CDSFFMPP. Yes, yes, that one. Um, yeah, so this one, I'm not sure if it's open source or not, but this one, uh, AIB generators from Bluecheater that is open source. Yes, yeah, so it's private. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this might be private because it's under this USB R. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to use this to show like how we run the generator. So. Any other questions? Yes, please. One more question regarding the to okay. this uh, architecture for tile zero and one. Can you back again to this slide? Sure. Yes. OK, yes, for this one. So from this architecture, should we stick to keep the number of fingers the same, right, for N and D B to KL or if we don't use all of them, so the other should be filling. So it means much, much area will be lost, right? So if you don't have same number of fingers for N and P, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, uh, the other space right. will be filled by, yeah. So that's, so, yes, that, that's why it's recommended for FinFET because the mobility of N holes and electrons for N and DB should be similar for in, in FinFET technology. So usually we recommend it for FinFET technology. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, one, yeah. another question about the passive element. What about uh, the, the update for R and C because it's not well defined in, in uh, back two. So what is the update oh, yeah. in factory? So I think for passive elements, the C, the mom cap is still is still done in a similar way. So similar way as back to there's a add mom cap class you can call to add mom cap and the resistors. I think it's set is. Also, in a similar way, you need to set up the resistor primitives, and there's an array base. Basically, pull the resistors in an array. So yeah, generally, I think those two passive uh, devices are done in a similar way as back to. Okay. I have one question. Yeah. The, the example you showed at the very end, um, the, the converter example, uh, how long mm -hmm. uh, could, could you elaborate a bit on how long you took for the generator code and maybe also a bit on the iteration? So, so how uh, to which degree um, the programming was um, traded off by um, the accelerated design? So, yeah, it's a little bit hard to count how long the I put in the generator code. But generally, I would say if you are writing some like block level generators, it's much faster than you do it by hand in FinFET process. For example, if you want have a comparator layout, I think it's faster to do this in a generator. But going up to higher level, like you want to assemble different blocks together, writing them in generator might be a little bit painful because those predefined routing grid, you have 
you lost some resolution because of that. So that means you need to, you need to do some actual calculations and make sure everything's symmetric, et cetera. So those tasks will be much easier if you do it manually by writing generators, it does take extra time. But of course, those generator code gives you like more possible like sizing tweaks after you're done with layout. Could you could you put this maybe in in the amount of uh, yeah weeks that it that it would take? Uh, well, of course it depends a lot on on the experience, uh, but just to get um to to get an idea. Uh, the how many weeks I put uh, writing a generator code, for example, like this. Yeah, yeah, or or maybe you even uh, you, so so I understood that you um mentioned like uh, uh building blocks, so maybe there's also some reused code inside. Um, that might accelerate, but uh, just just to have to have a figure, um, which yeah, or say order of magnitude of time it would take. So for this one, because this is the first time we start using Dexter generators at BWLC, so I don't actually have much things I can reuse. But for example, for these star ADC generators, I think is. It took me around one and a half months to write the code, like like for this code, like write code in a specific process, get the RCLS coding with some reasonable range of input parameters. Yeah, and the others basically take similar times, like this one takes probably one and a half months as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, just a follow up related question. Um, what, what do you think to which extent, if you would hand um, over your code to a colleague, um, how well um, or, or how well could a colleague continue with the code? Do, do you think that is like um, uh, that the back three gives structure enough so that um, it's uh, the code can be well understood, or um, are there some further yeah, steps to go to, to maybe even uh, accelerate the, the reuse of the code and uh, further development of the code? Mm, I would say it depends on like user experience. If you have right enough generator code, it's pretty easy to understand with some proper comments in the generator. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So, do we have any last question for Zhao Kai, or, or this is, this is it? <laughs> Everything is clear. It's my B, sir. So. Uh, so, okay, thank you so much for, for this presentation. I think compared to what I've seen before, it is kind of a bit advanced and we had more time to, to ask you the questions. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to finishing your PhD and, uh, uh, and let's say more generators coming from you. So yeah, I have a, you. yeah, I have a question like, you know, uh, what is, what is your general opinion as you know being at the end of the, this PhD uh, track? Uh, and you started probably with back two and you know moved to back three. So uh, you know how much actually this contributed? Did it kind of initially slow you down so much that later on you know what speed did you sped you up did not pay off, or it was at the end of the day kind of worth it? What is, you know, your kind of feeling regarding to it? Thanks. Yeah, I think for the time I spent on writing generator code, it's definitely worth it because without that, I'm not able to iterate on design like so fast. But in my opinion, the time we spend on writing generators, like I said earlier, when you try to assemble blocks together, writing generators, it definitely takes much, much more time than you manually 
draw the layout. So just imagine you are going to connect two blocks together. If you manually do a layout, you basically just put instantiation in the virtual and draw a wire. That's it, like very, very fast. But if you need to write the generators, you need to calculate the locations and calculate the tracks. And sometimes the make everything symmetric and at the ideal location you want is very hard. So I think this part, I don't really like it. But for example, with circuit like like a star IDC as a standalone circuit is definitely uh, worth the time I spend on to write the generator. But going to the higher level of assembling those different blocks together, I will more like assemble them in a manual way.